tonight, just as the shift from pandemic to endemic was looking more likely, our long-standing period of progress may be headed toward regression as two new fast-spreading subvariants quickly sweep the globe. And it's too soon to say exactly how the bivalent boosters will work against the newer strains. Good evening and welcome to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren. Joining us tonight, as always, world-renowned Dr. Jeffrey Gold, the chancellor of the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And a little bit later on, the governor of the state of Nebraska, Pete Ricketts, will join our conversation. You at home are also a big part of this show. In just a little bit, we're going to open up our phone lines to you. But first, Dr. Gold, interest in the pandemic has been renewed tonight by these new subvariants. But what do the latest numbers reflect? Sure. Well, Christina, thank you so much. And let's get right into the numbers. Uh, and hopefully uh, we'll get a great conversation uh, with the governor in just a few minutes. Uh, we start off with the worldwide global case map. And as you can see, for the very first time in a very, very, very long time, the United States and Canada are no longer in the orange and amber or red categories. Uh, and that reflects continued reduction in numbers uh, across North America. That's very different than what's going on in Europe right now, uh, particularly uh, in uh, parts of Italy uh, and in the Scandinavian regions, as you can see. And there's still quite a bit of dark red uh, and uh, amber uh, in Australia, uh, quite a bit in Japan and other parts of the Far East, as well as uh, still in the Chilean border uh, of South America. When we look at the global numbers, <clears throat> unfortunately, and again, they significantly underestimate uh, the caseloads, they are showing a small but definite increase. And although we saw, beginning in uh, early to mid-August, a continual decline in the global numbers, we're up about 5% over the last 14 days. And again, uh, those trends are significant uh, just because while the total numbers are clearly undercounting the cases, in this, in this instance, 463,000 cases in the last 24 hours, it just makes the point that worldwide COVID is not over and that we haven't seen the continued decline, but actually we're seeing a plateauing. And to a large extent, it's because of these new variants that you mentioned in your opening comments. Shifting to the U.S., uh, the numbers continue to look better and better. Uh, uh, unfortunately, we're still seeing quite a bit of activity in Kentucky, as we've seen for several weeks now. There are parts of Alaska, a good deal around some of the Great Lakes, uh, and in the northeastern uh, part of the country as well. However, the central part of the country, and I'm sure we'll talk a lot about this with the governor in a few minutes, uh, <clears throat> things continue to look better on a week-over-week -week basis. If we look at the U.S. numbers, uh, we're down to approximately 11 cases per 100,000 per day, or just under 38,000 new confirmed cases in the last 24 hours. The 14-day running average shows a 19% decrease uh, in the total number uh, per 100,000 uh, per day in the U.S., a significant change, uh, which has been a continued downward trend. Uh, albeit slightly slower than the downward trend rate that we saw after the beginning of the Omicron spike last winter, but it's still moving in the right direction, and hopefully uh, these new variants will not have a negative impact on that. And as we'll see in a few minutes, hospitalization rates are down, and intensive care unit stays are down uh, as well. Uh, again, uh, we are still seeing a fall in these overall rates in the seven-day rolling average. If we look at it by state, as I said earlier, the U.S. is at about 11 uh, cases per 100,000 per day, or just over 37,000 confirmed cases. But Rhode Island and Maine, uh, New York State, uh, Massachusetts and Michigan, uh, where we saw some hot spots, are somewhere between one and a half to twice the U.S. average. But when we look at some of the smaller rural communities, our farming and ranching communities, uh, such as Dickinson, Virginia, Grayson, Carroll, uh, McQuarrie, or Perry, Kentucky. Uh, you can see, although the case numbers are extremely small, per 100,000 per day, uh, the numbers are quite large, uh, several fold in many instances, 10 times uh, the U.S. case average, uh, making the point that even in small communities, uh, we still have to be very concerned about spread 
uh, that can be initiated in the schools, the churches, and other areas. This is a look at our wastewater numbers as we've looked at now for the last several months together. And as you see, the amount of dark blue and gray uh, that we're seeing widely across the United States are reporting now on over 960 different wastewater sites are all showing very positive trends. Indeed, the uh, numbers uh, that are uh, in the highest categories that we used to have several months ago, there are almost none. So, for instance, in the highest category, which is the 80 to 100 percent range, out of the total of nearly 1,000 sites, 12 of them are in that range. That's got to be one of the lowest numbers uh, that we've seen, and again, a very favorable trend for the future. Now, coming back to your earlier comments, Christina, about the distribution of virus lineages, you know, we went through a very, very long time where BA5 and BA4 were almost the only viral lineages that we were seeing in the country. Indeed, when these new bivalent vaccines were developed, they were developed specifically to have capabilities uh, to ward off against BA5, as well as some of the earlier variants of the virus. But BA5 is now down to about 67, 68 percent in the U.S., and this data is up through the end of last week. Uh, these two new BQ variants, BQ 1.1 and BQ 1.0, are now just under 6 percent and rising. And the BA 4.6, which is another one of these novel variants, uh, is up to about 12 percent. So if you add all that up, what you see is about 25 percent of the total infection rate in the U.S. Uh, is now due to one of these new variants. And unfortunately, there's a considerable amount of concern as to what the uh, vaccine breakthrough rates will be and what the reinfection rates will be with these variants, as they do appear to outcompete the BA4 and the BA5 and certainly the BA1 variants. And you can see, depending upon which part of the country you look at, uh, even in our home state here in Nebraska, uh, we're looking at about somewhere between 20 and 25 percent of our current cases are some of these new variants. Uh, even more than that in the Northeast, almost a third uh, in the Mid-Atlantic. Uh, if you look at the Southeast, you see very similar trends as well. Interestingly, slightly less so in the Pacific Northwest and the far west uh, part of our country. Uh, and so this is something we're following very carefully. Current data makes us believe that these bivalent vaccines will be effective against these new sublineages of BA5 because these two new sublineages are variants, are mutations of the BA5 uh, subtype. Again, what is happening here is while we're still gathering data about severity, and these new subtypes do appear to be uh, fairly severe, particularly for unvaccinated people, what is happening is that they are out competing the earlier uh, Omicron variants, which means they're more contagious and they have the capability uh, to escape the effects of some of our earlier vaccines and certainly uh, reinfection from Delta or some of the earlier uh, types of the Omicron spread, uh, something we follow very carefully. If we look at hospitalizations, again, uh, the trend has been uh, continued downward. Uh, if we look at that as data across the country, we're at about 26,400 hospitalizations currently, and this is data as of midnight last night, about 8 per 100,000. But Delaware, Washington, D.C., Maine, New York, Pennsylvania are somewhere between one and a half and two and a half times uh, the U.S. average of hospitalizations. And this tracks, unfortunately, uh, with the prevalence of these new variants. And so these clearly uh, not only can cause breakthrough infections, but are more than capable of causing uh, fairly severe illness and hospitalization. The U.S. hospitalization map uh, shows the same thing. Some activity in Kentucky, uh, some activity in North Carolina and South Carolina, a bit of activity, again, uh, in the Mid-Atlantic and in the Northeast. Central part of the country, Pacific Northwest, Far West, the Deep South, uh, looks pretty uh, healthy in terms of hospitalization. And again, a lot of pride in our home state as well. Uh, when we shift 
uh, to some of the case fatality rates. Again, we saw a big fall off uh, several months ago, but unfortunately, over the last uh, four to six weeks, while the numbers have been falling, they've not been falling as rapidly as the case rates. So we're still at about 0.11 deaths per 100,000 per day, or uh, just over uh, 373 unfortunate Americans uh, lost their life to COVID. But Alaska, Arkansas, Vermont, about three times the U.S. average. Kentucky, Delaware, about two and a half times the U.S. average. And so again, uh, we're seeing some of this tracking with new of these subtypes that we've identified uh, across the U.S. This is just a look at current influenza rates and, of course, uh, overall uh, pneumonia and COVID mortality from the National Center for Health Statistics Mortality Surveillance Program. And as you see, as uh, recently uh, as last week, we're still seeing, uh, uh, you know, influenza-like illness uh, deaths higher than we would see from a normal flu year although the number of flu cases across the U.S. Uh, actually uh, continues to be rising uh, at a pretty good clip. So COVID deaths are falling, flu deaths uh, and hospitalization rates are actually rising. So it's a strong message to get your flu vaccine if you haven't already done so. Overall vaccine status for COVID, really no change since last time we uh, chatted, uh, about a third of our population is boosted, and just over 15 million of the bivalent doses administered. Again, uh, a very small uh, amount compared to uh, those that are eligible. We did see a peak, particularly in the over 65 age population of the bivalent vaccine. But again, as you can see, those trends are not rising, they are falling, particularly now that they're available to our school-age kiddos, uh, they're available to our seniors, and everybody else in between, uh, it would be really nice to see those numbers uh, continue uh, to rise up. So, Christina, a lot of questions uh, during the week about long COVID. So I thought I would take just a few minutes uh, to try to focus our audience attention. Now, you may recall uh, that last spring uh, we showed this graphic uh, that looked at the science and tech spotlight on long COVID. And it talked about uh, the typical type of headache, brain fog, and cognitive impairment. It talked about loss of taste and smell, pounding heartbeats, irregular heartbeats, heart failure, cough, shortness of breath, uh, skin rashes, uh, decreased renal function, and so many other phenomena. And we've been tracking the long COVID or post-COVID very carefully with our audience from time to time. And during the week, uh, a very important new study uh, was released that I thought I would share with you. Uh, and, and this was published in a major medical journal titled Outcomes Among Confirmed COVID Cases and Matched Comparison. And this was done in Scotland. Now, just to give our audience an idea, uh, there were uh, just under 63,000 individuals who were never infected with COVID. And there were just over 33,000 laboratory confirmed that means PCR confirmed uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, COVID uh, cases. And these people, all of this nearly 100,000 cohort, were followed for 18 months with questionnaires that's 6, 12, and 18 months. And as you can see here, the average age of this entire cohort was about 45, <clears throat> both the never infected and the asymptomatic infected, and those that were symptomatic uh, you can see the breakdown here between male and female, uh, and you can also see the breakdown uh, by race and ethnicity. So when we look at the outcome of this study, uh, what you're looking at here in this somewhat complex eye chart, unfortunately, is that in, even in the asymptomatic group, that is to say those people that had COVID and were symptomatic versus those people that had COVID that were asymptomatic, uh, tiredness, headache, muscle aches, joint pain, breathlessness, much more significant factors. So for instance, tiredness and fatigue uh, for those that were asymptomatic, eight times uh, percentage, uh, 8%. For those that had symptomatic COVID, 44% of those uh, had tiredness out to uh, 18 months. Uh, 
hearing problems, uh, visual problems, a feeling of pins and needles, chest pain, palpitations, poor appetite, belly pain, uh, diarrhea, constipation, just a long list of long COVID symptoms that we've discussed. Now, the other part of this study <clears throat> looked at the activities of daily living. So things such as walking around, ha typical housework, uh, working and studying, uh, getting dressed in the morning, exercise and sport, hobbies, relationships, uh, all of these had significant changes uh, in the incidence of these uh, long COVID uh, syndromic events uh, in the symptomatic group, but not in the asymptomatic group. And so these authors conclude uh, that uh, of the 31,000 symptomatic patients, 6%, uh, not a trivial number, but 6%, even at 18 months, had not recovered from their long COVID uh, symptoms. However, 42% only recovered partially. And indeed, there was no recovery that was associated with hospitalized infection, age, uh, female sex, uh, respiratory disease, depression, and, and uh, multimorbidity. Uh, interestingly also was that previous symptomatic infection, again, not asymptomatic infection, but symptomatic infection, those people who had COVID who were tested positive and had symptoms was associated with a poor quality of life, impairment across all of the daily activities, and 24 persistent symptoms, most importantly are breathlessness, palpitations, chest pain, uh, and confusion. So this is one of the largest and I think most consistent studies. Now, understandingly, that we are not Scotland, and uh, it's tough to draw direct comparisons uh, between Scotland, the United Kingdom, other large studies uh, in long COVID and the U.S. But this is an awareness to us of a signal that we're going to have to follow uh, very carefully. And then finally, Christina, uh, just one more graphic for our audience tonight and that looks at our monkeypox cases worldwide. And the numbers have fairly well plateaued at approximately 73,000 uh, cases, indeed at 109 uh, different countries worldwide. Uh, the U.S. numbers continue to fall, uh, demonstrating a very successful campaign, at least thus far, using what's known as ring vaccination and awareness of those individuals uh, who are at the highest risk of monkeypox. So hopefully this would be a positive example of the ability to stop the spread of uh, this orthopox virus. So I th think we should stop with the graphics uh, at this point. I look forward to your questions, questions from our audience, and of course the opportunity to uh, introduce Governor Ricketts again uh, to our audience in just a few minutes. I think we have a lot more viewership tonight, Dr. Gold, because of these two new variants. And you're right. We welcome you to this conversation. 877-731-6733 is the number to call with any question that you have. My first question, of course, is going to be about one of these variants. XBB appears to be the fastest spreading COVID variant yet. Um, the White House COVID czar just an hour ago is calling on all seniors to get that Omicron booster shot. Now, it's being deemed the nightmare COVID variant. That's a pretty scary name, especially at this point in the pandemic, Dr. Gold. What can you tell us about this specific variant? Well, it, the characteristics of it are certainly for those people that do not have immunity, that it has a very high likelihood of causing hospitalization. And unfortunately, while we haven't seen a lot of numbers on it, probably causing enough serious illness in seniors and people with multiple comorbidities to cost them their lives. And particularly as the weather is starting to get colder, people are doing more and more indoor events. We're getting close to thinking about the Thanksgiving holidays and other gatherings uh, with our family and loved ones. Uh, this is just a time to be extra prepared. And there's good reason to believe that the uh, double-barreled vaccine, the bivalent vaccine that both Pfizer and Moderna are now marketing, has specific capability to the BA5 subtype lineage of the Omicron strain. And for all of those reasons, uh, and by the way, availability of the vaccine now for our kiddos down to the age of five, uh, this is really the time to uh, to get vaccinated uh, with these boosters. Uh, for those people that haven't been vaxxed yet, 
Uh, not only are these new vaccines available, but the Novavax, a pure protein construct vaccine, is now available and FDA approved uh, on the market. And it'd be a really good thing to get all this done before we get into the uh, holiday season. You know, I think time is only going to tell how much transmission we're going to see. Estimates are <clears throat> that the overwhelming majority of our communities have been infected at least once. But only time will tell how severe this is going to be. Yeah. And if, if these new booster shots will work as well, it's interesting. You know, let's talk about that. I think some people are hesitant to get the booster because they're worried about the reactions. Of course, in my mind, I think, well, what happens if you get COVID? It's going to be a lot worse than the more common reactions that you see. But some say that these updated boosters have even stronger reactions associated with them. Is that true? And what is the correlation between booster side effects and booster efficacy, if any? Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, there's just a lot of different uh, data sources uh, that are currently available. Uh, uh, I personally have just a large number of colleagues and friends uh, who have received the bivalent booster and have had little to no uh, reactions to it. You know, I, I guess the good news is we'd like to see some reaction, uh, whether it's just soreness in the arm or a little bit of fatigue, some sleeplessness, uh, possibly even a low-grade fever, which means that our immune systems are getting turned on and responding to the vaccines. Some of the severity of the reactions are probably related to time. That is to say, the longer window uh, between your previous booster and this, the higher the likelihood is you're going to really rev up your immune system uh, to respond uh, to it. Uh, so some reaction is probably a good sign. Uh, you know, uh, certainly in terms of the severity of reactions, uh, and there's a lot of data on that that's out there right now. You're talking about hundreds of millions of doses of vaccines uh, uh, in the United States alone, let alone worldwide. Uh, there is no more severity. There's no signaling of anything more severe uh, going on with these Pfizer and Moderna uh, boosters. And indeed, uh, to the contrary, the efficacy of reducing hospitalization, particularly in people that are most vulnerable, people with heart disease, diabetes, and, and other conditions, or people that are on medications that suppress their immune system, appear to be extremely favorable. So the uh, odds are of you're getting seriously sick or losing your life uh, from COVID are thousands, literally thousands of times higher than anything that might occur from the vaccines. Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting because here we are, holiday season just around the corner. Again, we have new variants that we have to be concerned about. And I'm wondering if when we start going to the stores, we're going to start seeing masks coming out again and going on a trip, for example, in an airplane, or should we be wearing masks once again? Is it just a wise idea right now? So, you know, uh, everybody needs to take their own precautions as they feel, uh, you know, appropriate. Uh, you know, I had the opportunity to have some air travel this weekend to see some family members that I hadn't seen in a bit. I would say about 25% uh, of the folks in the airports and on the planes are still wearing a mask. And by the way, uh, they're wearing either an N95 or a KN95 mask, one of the better quality respirator masks. Uh, uh, in, in local food stores, uh, obviously, uh, it's less, uh, you know, certainly on the streets, uh, in our large cities and in our rural communities, uh, it's far less. You know, I think, it, you know, as we've learned from this pandemic, going back to the very, very beginning, that it's all local and that in, you know, small communities, if they're dealing with high outbreak rates or significant hospitalization, uh, you know, we all know that the masks are protective. Uh, similarly, uh, if you're dealing with very low transmission rates, if you're dealing with almost no or, or literally no hospitalizations in your local communities, that your health care organizations are capable of dealing with uh, additional cases should they occur, perhaps a little more uh, freedom to be maskless and to gather in larger uh, social groups. But, you know, if you're going to visit with grandparents or friends uh, that have medical conditions, uh, you know, the current recommendations are, at least the recommendations that I follow, is I get tested before I travel and visit with people. And then if I'm at all uncertain about their medical conditions, uh, you know, I choose to uh, wear my mask. I mean, you know, everybody will be making uh, personal decisions, but a lot can change 
uh, between now and when Santa comes down the chimney. <laughs> right around the corner now. Okay, I want to make sure you have an opportunity to join our conversation tonight. We haven't opened up the phone lines just yet, but we are getting ready to do so right now. The number to call in, grab a pen, 877 877- 731-6733. Our first question tonight comes from Colleen in Florida. Thanks so much for joining us this evening, Colleen. You're on with Dr. Gold. Dr. Gold, I want to talk about this nightmare COVID variant that could beat our immunity. I was wondering, what are your main concerns for the vulnerable population? Thank you. Well, they're the same concerns, Colleen, that we have seen with all of the other variants uh, going back to the very beginning of the pandemic, uh, which is, you know, fall into two different categories. One category, of course, is severe illness that's severe enough to go to the emergency room or receive other health care that's severe enough to be hospitalized or potentially in older or more vulnerable individuals could potentially cost them their lives. However, the other side of that equation is dealing with the fragility of our economy and dealing with the impact on, you know, schools, early child care, uh, the staffing of our restaurants, uh, uh, the ability to gather in groups for athletic uh, programs, cultural programs, uh, et cetera. You know, hiring uh, of workforce uh, at so many different levels, particularly in our healthcare professions, which I know so well, Uh, is tenuously balanced right now. If we had a lot of people calling out uh, due to illness, even if they weren't sick enough uh, to be hospitalized, that could have a huge and a chilling effect on our, you know, normal lives. If you think about it, uh, those people in the grocery stores, those people that stock our shelves, our truckers, our, you know, flight crews in our airlines, all of that is, you know, slowly but surely returning to a more normal level You know, as I said earlier, I had the pleasure of going through some of our airports uh, and airplanes uh, over the weekend. And, you know, there wasn't a single seat on the flights that uh, I was on. It was just like it was uh, pre-pandemic. It would be a shame to see uh, recurrence of a more transmissible variant uh, interrupt uh, any of that. So, again, just a bit of care, Colleen, would be warranted. All right. Thank you so much for that call, Colleen. We really appreciate it. And that leaves a line open for your question tonight. 877-731-6733 is the number to call. Now, if flu season does bring a surge of cases, are hospitals in a better position than previous pandemic years because we've been building up to this moment? I know, like me, a lot of people do have concern right now about these two variants. Sure. So I think we are much better prepared this year than we've ever been. I think these oral and intravenous uh, antiviral agents uh, should work for these new, uh, more communicable subtypes. That's the preliminary information. Uh, And by that, I mean the Paxlovid and the Monopiravir drugs. Uh, The monoclonal antibodies, uh, jury's out. Uh, There's some thought that they will not be effective because of the type of mutation that has occurred in the spike protein of these new uh, variants. Uh, But, you know, we've learned a lot more about ventilatory support. We've learned a lot more about what's called prone positioning. That is to say, how people actually are allowed to recover in the hospital, what positions are best and healthiest for them. And obviously, we know a lot more about the long-term effects of covid and a lot more about ways to reduce the severity of these illnesses. So, you know, do we know everything we need to know to be sure that we can make sure that people either stay out of the hospital or don't lose their life? Of course not. Uh, We haven't figured that out for influenza, and that's been going on for well over 100 years. Uh, We certainly haven't figured it out for COVID. But we're a lot better prepared. You know, I would say, Christina, the message to the audience is if people become symptomatic or have a high-risk exposure, please get tested. And if you're testing negative with a home test, test more than once, maybe even twice or three times. If you're symptomatic and you're testing negative at home, go get a PCR test because some of these new subtypes are escaping these uh, home uh, antigen tests with a higher degree of frequency. And again, the very best advice, the single most important advice, if you or a loved one uh, become ill, 
certainly if you test positive, put a call into your local health care professional because the sooner that you can get started on some of these medications, the more likely they are to be effective. Okay. 877-731-6733 is the number to call with your question. We're going to pause for a quick break, but we'll have more Rural Health Matters coming your way right after this. Stay with us. Much more to come. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Rural Health Matters. Joining us once again, Dr. Jeffrey Gold, the Chancellor of the University of Nebraska Medical Center, world-renowned doctor. And joining us now, another man that you are probably very familiar with, Nebraska Governor Pete Ricketts joins our conversation. And we are so glad that you're joining us tonight. Let me tell you a little bit about Mr. Ricketts that you may not know. Sworn in as Nebraska's 40th governor, Ricketts is the son of a great entrepreneur and a whip-smart school teacher turned businesswoman. Prior to becoming governor, he worked in the business world himself, first for Union Pacific, and then he went on to hold leadership roles at Ameritrade. He was the CEO, COO rather. He was reelected to a second term of governor in November of 2018, but sadly, because of term limits... We're not going to get to keep you much longer, and uh, it's unfortunate because you've done a lot for your constituents in the great state of Nebraska. So first and foremost, I want to thank you for joining us. Thank you for your service to this country and to Nebraska. Your state did what some analysts have called the best job of any state in managing various factors of the pandemic. What would you say is the main reason why? Well, hey, thanks very much for having me on. And uh, Jeff, great seeing you as well. You know, I think that there were several things that really helped us through the pandemic. Uh, one of which was we got some great advice early on from the University of Nebraska Medical Center saying, hey, Governor, this is a virus. You can't stop it, but you can slow it enough to protect your hospital capacity. And that was really the key for us is that we didn't look at positivity rates or case counts. We focused on hospitalizations to make sure that we would have the hospital capacity to be able to treat people who had really acute symptoms. And so all of our directed health measures, restrictions and so forth were really tied to how many people we had in the hospital with COVID that were potentially displacing other people who would need those hospital beds. And then we also treated uh, the state of Nebraska like one big hospital system. So that was a key thing. All of our hospitals worked very well together not one hospital said no to a COVID patient as we moved them around. And then uh, finally, I think one of the keys is that we did a lot of communication. We did a lot of communication with regard to the public. We did five press conferences every day of the week, plus uh, then two additional ones in Spanish to talk about what we knew. And then uh, lots of phone calls with whether it's the CEOs or the chief medical officers of the hospital systems, talking to the mayors of our largest cities, talking to the, oh, just uh, talking to the, um, uh, all the other municipalities, the counties, our public health directors. Uh, I think one of the advantages we had, if we had 19 public health districts versus some states where they have a, a health department for every county. So that certainly helped us be able to communicate to a relatively fewer number of people and be able to, to you know, help uh, them through the pandemic. So I think for a variety of reasons, we did very well here in the state, uh, not the least of which though that Nebraskans always look to take care of their neighbors. And we saw that in the floods of 2019 and again during this pandemic. Yeah, they take care of their neighbors regardless of political party lines, which is interesting to me. And you, sir, were able to garner bipartisan support all the way down the road, which is another reason why I think that you were so successful. As we continue to live with COVID now, how often are you briefed about the latest variants? And has this been built into your daily routine or are the reports starting to wane at this juncture? What's it looking like for you? Well, we actually ended the uh, health emergency here in Nebraska in June of uh, 2021. But of course, my public health department continues to stay on top of what the most uh, recent data is on the variants and so forth. I think that uh, one of the things that we're still encouraging people to do is that, hey, if you're more at risk, you're certainly going to need to take care. Uh, one of the things I said early on this pandemic is that COVID is never going away. It is going to be with us forever. So if you're at risk, if you're 65 years and older, if you've got those underlying health conditions, you're always going to have to be more watchful with regard to your own health, getting the vaccines and so forth, than say somebody who's in grade school, which we know, you know, kids are really not impacted by this the same way that people who are 65 years and older. Right. Well, you did, I mean, you did a lot of great things and we're going to continue to unpack those as we go through the evening together, but it must stand, feel pretty good to stand at the top of the 50 states as knowing that, that you guys were able to do the most for your constituents, looking out for your people working together. 
Well, it's a team effort. It's always a team effort. It's not one person. It's a lot of people, whether it's our you know, uh, folks in the counties, the public health officials, uh, Nebraskans in general. It, it really takes a lot of people to be successful. Yeah, and great leadership is a key component of that. Dr. Gold knows all about that. Okay, we're going to go to the phone lines. Connie from Florida joins us now. Thanks for joining us. Connie, go right ahead. Thank you. Dr. Gold, I have had COVID back in April, but I have been boosted and I have been had all of my uh, shots. And right now I have a heart. Uh, it feels like I'm having a heart attack and I... Um, I have shortness of breath. I can hardly walk half a mile without just having to stop and and um, sit down. And I was wondering how long will this long COVID last? Well, Connie, first of all, I'm sorry to hear that you're still being challenged by the symptoms of long COVID. And by the way, uh, my advice to you, which would be to anyone who is still having those types of symptoms, if they're getting rapidly worse, you should probably put down the phone and call 911 or call your local health care professional uh, and get some help. Uh, the threshold for doing that should be quite low. But in answer to your question, if this is part of a long COVID syndrome, uh, we really don't know how long these are going to last for. The overwhelming majority of them are short-lived, meaning uh, 30 to 60 days. But as a, the data that I just shared a few minutes ago uh, from the study in Scotland that looked at over 30,000 uh, patients who had uh, uh, symptomatic uh, COVID, uh, some of them lasted a full 18 months. And again, about 6% at the time of the 18-month follow-up were still having symptoms. And so this is a time for you or, and frankly, for all individuals that have any long COVID symptoms to be working with your local health care professionals because there are things that can be done. In many instances, there are medications that can reduce the severity of the long COVID symptoms. Uh, in some instances, there's some physical therapy or some rehab uh, that can be done. And most importantly, uh, particularly for people that are having chest pain, shortness of breath, or other cardiac or neuro symptoms, you really want to be sure that there isn't something else going on. Because in spite of the fact you may be uh, recovering uh, through a period of long COVID, uh, that doesn't mean that you either don't have another cardiac problem, a lung problem, a problem with your central nervous system or one of your blood vessels that's precipitating some of these symptoms that may look and sound a lot like long COVID, but may be very treatable uh, for other reasons. So uh, pick up the phone, uh, call 911 or call your local health care professional, and uh, I'm sure this will get resolved for you. Thanks for calling, and I wish you the best. Yeah, thank you for calling, Connie. Really, really appreciate you calling in tonight and trusting Dr. Gold with a call like that. 877-731-6733 is the number to call to join our conversation. I want to bring the governor back in the conversation for a moment because we're doing a lot of hindsight thinking this day and age. Uh, Dr. Gold was just talking about a Never Again series of talks that they're going to be hosting at UNMC. As we start to reflect on what we could have done differently, what we did right, what we did wrong, let's talk about the approaches that you took in rural versus urban areas. How were those different? Well, I don't know that they were different per se from a broad stroke. It was really about communication and letting people know what we knew with regard to the virus, what they could do to protect themselves and that sort of thing. I think one of the biggest differences, one of the biggest uh, things that was different between the rural areas and our urban areas was the ability to be able to treat acute COVID patients. And so again, this gets back to where we treated our entire state as one big hospital system. So we would move patients from rural hospitals, critical access hospitals, and move them to our bigger hospitals, say in Omaha and Lincoln. And frankly, as the pandemic went on and hospitals got more confident in treating patients and knew what level of severity, a lot of those rural hospitals then started keeping more of those patients, which of course then took pressure off the hospitals in Lincoln and Omaha. But I think a lot of it gets back to just communication and letting people know, what do we know about the virus at this point? What can you do to protect yourself and your family? Yeah. I would, I would ask you, um, I'm sure that the first term in office looked very different than the second term for you. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about how that was different and, and, and what, what you learned about yourself through the process in that position at that time. 
Well, the first term, we were dealing with many of the things that you would expect to deal with in government, uh, trying to do a better job providing our services, legislation, and so forth. In my second term, uh, we had the most historic flooding we've had in Nebraska in 2019, followed by the pandemic. And then, of course, during the pandemic, we all had civil uh, unrest in our major cities and so forth. And I would say that the, the thing that we learned the most is that we had a great team, that People really pulled together, especially during the pandemic, where there was really no playbook on how to handle this. And uh, all the work that we had done building that team over the previous term I had really paid off. I, I certainly wouldn't have wanted anybody to go through it, but if we had to manage it, I, I would have wanted my team to do it because they just did a fantastic job. So you had the team in place, but what about your own personal fortitude? Did you think that you were going to be so strong? Did you ever think that you could be so strong in an event like that? What did you learn about yourself? Well, Christine, I got to tell you, I, I'm not much of a navel gazer and, you know, you just do what you do at the time. Yeah. You know, uh, there really wasn't a choice. So we didn't really think about, oh, I got to be strong today. We're like, hey, what do we got to get done today? You know, I, I just, uh, you know, I'm just gratified that we had a great team and that they did a great job. Uh, I'm glad we're through it. <laughs> I wouldn't want to do it again. But, uh, you know, our team did a fantastic job and I'm very proud of them. Yeah, yeah, I think that um, going into this time where now you're not going to be in office any longer. You talked about going on vacation with your wife as one of the first things you're going to do. You're going to have time to think about that. I think you're going to be impressed how you were able to stand up to the challenge. Well, thanks. Uh, not thanks. everybody can say A lot of great that. people advising me. Yeah, well, it's impressive. So we're going to go back to the phones. We have another caller joining us now, Jay from Missouri. Thanks for joining us, Jay. Go right ahead. Uh, Dr. Gold, thank you. You've become a portion of my Monday evening that I really appreciate. My question is this. If... We'll never know. <laughs> We're having a hard time hearing him. I think they're going to try to get him back on the phone. But in the meantime, we talked a lot about recent years, people taking sides, going into their separate corners during the pandemic. Governor Ricketts, how do you handle that when you're the governor? You've got to be the leader of Nebraska. You want to have a unified response to an emergency. Did you ever have to pull out the big voice in meetings? What, what did you have to do to maintain control? Well, I think one of the things that's great about Nebraska is that we have a culture of collaboration, of working together. And uh, so, frankly, there were times when I had to make phone calls to leaders of different organizations to solicit their help. Uh, uh, you know, we had some hospitals, for example, that weren't providing data that we needed to be able to measure the hospitalization, for example. Uh, but I think that uh, really people in Nebraska generally get together, they collaborate, they work together to solve problems. And that's I think one of the, again, one of the strengths of our state, you know, and, and then again, it's just about a lot of communication. I mentioned all the different groups that I was having weekly phone calls with to let them know what we were seeing and let them ask questions. So people want to feel like they've been brought along, which means you got to talk to them, you have communication. And so that, that was one of the, the key things I think that helped us get through it. And then, you know, we really tried to strike a balance. Uh, we tried not to go too far one way or another with regard to this. And, uh, you know, also let local folks, um, you know, know, um, you know, they're going to have different situations at different times. The state is not going to have the same outbreaks in one place versus another. And that's why we're all in this together and why we're moving again, people around in hospitals. So I think a lot of it is just a lot of communication to let people know what was going on. Yeah, and it takes an open mind to strike a balance like you're talking about. So that's also part of it. 877-731-6733 is the number to call in with your question. It sounds like we got Jay back from Missouri. Thanks for calling back, Jay. Go right ahead. We want to hear from you. Yeah, my, my question is, if I have a person who has not been vaccinated, where do they start? Do they go back to the original vaccination or what shot did they get first or how does that work? So, Jay, that's a question that a lot of people are asking right now because of the fact that the new uh, COVID bivalent boosters have just been approved by the Food and Drug Administration uh, and the CDC as just that, as boosters and not as primary vaccines. Uh, I would say that the best place to start is to go to their local health care professional and get their recommendation 
as to what they are doing in their local community. You know, certainly the, the textbook answer is that either the Novavax, uh, the Moderna, or the Pfizer original series of two shots, uh, either three or four weeks apart, would be the textbook answer. But what's going on across the country is there's a good deal of mixing and matching uh, with some of the new bivalent doses, with some of the original doses, etc. I guess the most important message is that if somebody has not been vaxxed at all, is this is the time to really do something. Uh, but what happens would be driven more by local practice, I think. Again, the textbook answer is uh, the original uh, non-bivalent uh, Pfizer, Moderna, or Novavax products uh, in the usual uh, two-dose regimen. But I would hasten to say that there's a lot of variability that uh, we're aware of uh, across the country right now. But it is great at this point of the pandemic just to get a call like that. We are going to take a quick break. Roger from Idaho, I know you're holding on the line. We appreciate you. Please continue to hold just a little bit longer. We're going to come right back on the other side of this break with your question and more with Governor Pete Ricketts as well as Dr. Gold. Stay with us. More Rural Health Matters after this. Welcome back to Rural Health Matters. Joining us once again is Dr. Jeffrey Gold, the Chancellor of the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And joining us tonight, Nebraska Governor Pete Ricketts is with us. As promised, we're going to go back to the phone. We are going to Idaho, where Roger joins the conversation tonight. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for hanging on the line, Roger. Go right ahead. Yes, I'm 82 years old in good health. We've had both our boosters. We'll have our third booster within the next few days, but uh, Prevnar 20, the pneumonia shot. And uh, I'm wondering, I had the old shots, the, the two shots, about nine or ten years ago. Should I get the new shot? Yeah, Roger, you know, uh, first of all, uh, congratulations on, on getting uh, uh, fully vaxxed and having your up-to-date boosters and, of course, scheduling uh, your next bivalent uh, COVID booster. In terms of the timing of your Pneumovax vaccine, which I think is what you're referring to, that would be a question that I would ask your local healthcare professional. And don't forget, you also need to time out your flu vaccine as well. Uh, uh, certainly the recommendation would be, would be to not add all three of those things together at one time. I think that would be a pretty heavy load on your immune system, particularly for uh, someone not uh, in their early 80s. But the priorities, uh, I think, uh, are exactly as you have sp uh, specified them. You want to get your COVID booster. You probably want to get your flu shot either at the same time or, you know, within a week or 10 days thereafter. And then the Pneumovax uh, enhanced uh, boosters are available. Uh, 10 years is a reasonable interval for them. But the timing of that should be uh, driven by your local uh, health care professional. So best of luck to you and, uh, and certainly uh, keep up the good work. Thank you so much for that call. That leaves a line open for you tonight, 877-731-6733. We're going to go back to Governor Ricketts now. Nebraska, like we were talking with Dr. Gold, for instance, has some of the world's leaders in areas of emergency management, infectious diseases, how can Nebraska help our whole nation, though, prepare for the next pandemic or emergency situation? Well, as you mentioned, Nebraska is one of the leading states and University of Nebraska Medical Center in particular with regard to infectious diseases. And I think one of the, the key things we can do for the future is really leverage those resources at our IXL Center, the, uh, the Davis Global Center there, to be able to help train people remotely with regard to how they can handle the types of procedures or diseases or what protocols, whatever they're going to need to be doing. It's one of the strengths that we can leverage with regard to the technology and the resources that we have at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And in fact, uh, Omaha and UNMC has been uh, nominated to be one of the five pilot sites to work with the Defense Department on this kind of program. And Dr. Gold is certainly much more of an expert on this than I am. And I would certainly um, defer to him if he wanted to expand upon that. But I think that's one of the key parts that we can play here in Nebraska with regard to what we can do for the future health of this nation. 
Well, you know, you, you bring up the Defense Department and you know that they're very selective as to who they want to go forward with. So that says something alone. Now, since you were term limited and unfortunately cannot seek a third term, what are you going to tell the person who steps in after you about the significance of UNMC, not just for Nebraska, for the entire world? Yeah, I mean, again, it gets back to just looking at the record at UNMC. We, UNMC has got one of the, I think, three biocontainment centers in the United States. We're the only federally funded quarantine space. And of course, during the uh, pandemic in February of 2020, we were some of the folks that took in uh, American citizens from, say, the Diamond Princess and so forth, and very successfully managed that at a time when nobody knew what was going on. So I think that the key is just leverage the, you know, I tell my successor to leverage the resources we have here at UNMC. We're very blessed to have that. And as I mentioned, you know, I got some great advice early on from UNMC about what to focus on with regard to hospitalizations. And so I think that's part of uh, one of the reasons we did so well is, again, we had that resource right in our own backyard. Well, you know, it's interesting. Your successor might be calling you while you're traveling the Caribbean <laughs> in the boat. So you did a lot of things right. Um, I know Dr. Gold played a huge role in that. Dr. Gold, if you will, speak to the role of, of connecting with government officials like Governor Ricketts, why it's so important for you. You do a lot of the reaching out yourself. I don't know that our audience knows that. You do a lot of the initiating of these conversations in order to keep people on the same page. Why is that so important to you? Well, it's just been critically important to this entire story. And I think Governor Ricketts was exactly right. There's no I in the word team. Uh, these are people who really have the very best uh, intentions for the health and wellness of the state of Nebraska. And I don't just mean the medical health and wellness, but I mean the economic stability, the need to keep our kiddos in school, the need to keep our universities and colleges open, the need to make our businesses successful and to support not just today, but the future workforce of our state. And that's where this partnership has been so critical. And it's been just an amazing pleasure and honor to work so closely with Governor Ricketts and his leadership team. And you know, we, we are aware that it's not over and we continue uh, to have that outreach and, and that communication. And I think it portends as a very successful model for the future on how to mitigate future health security challenges that we may have. Absolutely. Okay, we have time for one more caller tonight. Laverne from Colorado. Thanks for joining us. Go right ahead. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Go right can ahead. You? Okay, I've had um, three shots of the Moderna, and I want to go get my fourth shot. Uh, should it be Moderna or should it be Pfizer? Uh, Laverne, uh, you know, it probably doesn't make any difference uh, of these uh, bivalent boosters, whether it's Pfizer or Moderna, given the fact that you've had good experiences, hopefully, with the Moderna. If you can get it, I would say go for it. But there's also a bit of data that if you mix and match, you may get a little bit longer effect from the booster, and it may be somewhat more effective in preventing reinfection. So it's about six of one, half a dozen of the other. I would be driven more by what's immediately available to you and most convenient and not worry so much about whether it's Pfizer or Moderna. Uh, but thanks for calling. Appreciate you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Laverne. Okay, we just have a little bit of time left. I want to leave you the floor, Governor Ricketts. What are your final thoughts for our audience tonight? Well, uh, just thanks very much for having me on. Uh, we appreciate it here. And, you know, uh, like I said, I think in Nebraska, we took a balanced approach to be able to slow down the spread of the virus. We had a seven point plan to be able to do that that included contact tracing testing quarantine space ppe to everybody uh, our directed health measures and of course then the vaccines and so forth so um you know there's a lot of work that goes into it and it's always a team effort so you just gotta have a, a great team and that's what we had here in nebraska yeah now you and dr gold should co-author a book about it for the rest of the world thanks for joining us we'll see you next time right here mm -hmm.